Greg, for one, if you'll step out in the hall. Thank you for the fun of it. And on the grading, put on the clipboard that you have at your um, put deep, deep notes throughout the morning. You will be submitting your votes for the amount of money that goes to a particular group as a team. You won't do it individually, you'll do it as a group. So keep notes on that clipboard um, to be sure that you can discuss it pretty quickly. At the end of the day, one member of your team will go submit your vote on a Google form. So you want to have some conversation as the day moves on. There are 10 minutes for each presentation, theoretically now that we're starting late, maybe not. 10 minutes for presentation and then five minutes between. So the teachers will be asking you some questions and we have a little transitional time. So quietly discuss things. If the teachers are asking questions, don't talk to them, of course. But we certainly will have time during lunch for you to come back together and think about what you are thinking about the top presentation. We are presenting on alternatives to animal-derived medical products. An animal-derived medical product is a medicine or medically product that comes from animals and is derived from animals. This can be directly through the animal or through something that the animal may create, such as an egg from a chicken. We need alternatives for this. The negative effects of animal-derived medical products are its negative effects on culture, dietary concerns, and the actual negative effects that it has on the animals. This biotechnology also proposes this. We will be creating a capsule for medicine that does not contain any animal-derived medical products. This would limit the factors that were mentioned earlier, as well as this bi biotechnology will limit the environmental factors that ADM products normally have. Through granting our proposal, we will change medicine permanently as it will cause less harm as well as it will be more reliable and efficient. Current, ac current actions. Um, as of right now, there isn't many researches and studies on alternatives to ADM products. Um, one study is on the effects of herbal medicine on PMS, which is premenstrual syndrome. Um, in the study, it showed that herbal medicines such as like chamomile, saffron, helped reduce symptoms of like feelings of depression and anxiety that come from PMS. Um, in the legislation area, like with the government, they're more focused on informing patients. Um, one of the laws in the UK states that, well, for the dental industry, uh, states that before a dentist can use any gases or products on their patient, they must inform them of the ingredients and let them uh, make an informed decision on whether or not that they should use that product during the procedure. Um, these are small steps in the right direction, but with our proposal and our product, we plan to take more steps locally to help. Compelling issue. 
With our proposal, we plan to uh, address and fix the lack of alternative options to ADM, animal-derived medical products. This will help those who either can't take the product because it goes against personal beliefs, their religious beliefs, or physically cannot take it due to health risks. This will provide more options for our widely diverse and ever-changing population and give them choices in their health care. Um, with these uh, alternative options, we will have proper treatment for all and have better health in general. That makes sense. So an overview of our proposal. So through our grant, we plan to develop a dissolvable capsule that any pharmaceutical company can use to put their drugs into that does not contain any animal products. So with this addition, those who have allergies to products, those who have religious beliefs that prohibit certain animal products from being consumed, or those who have just other dietary needs, uh, it can be more inclusive. The medical industry can be more inclusive to them. So this is a lot more achievable than some other ideas to alternatives, such as synthetic drugs, which are a lot more costly, a lot more risky, and a lot less inclusive, if that makes sense. So with this, we're able to increase the amount of people who actually can receive help and do it at a low cost. For our artifact, we'll be creating a medical capsule that does not contain any type of animal substances. Furthermore, the process of making this capsule will not contain any type of animal testing, allowing our capsule and our process to be free of any type of animal derivatives. We are making this capsule due to majority of the capsules containing some type of trace of gelatin, which does not allow religions and dietary restrictions to be able to consume it due to gelatin coming from pig. Yes, they do make alternative capsules, but we are trying to provide a more accessible variety to our area and allow pharmaceuticals to be more inclusive to everyone, allowing everyone to get the help that they deserve. So for our project, we plan to research with UVA, getting a lab down there and employing a team of researchers to create our product. Once we acquire the lab and the people we need, we're going to purchase the required materials for the first prototypes. Um, through a variety of different methods and a variety of different companies. Once we successfully develop a prototype, we'll begin testing on synthetic tissue. Uh, once we find a successful method that works on the tissue, we'll move on to our FDA and human trials, uh, which should all be concluded within less than a year if all goes well. Our budget consists of 10 expenses. The first pro uh, part of our process is research, which is $75,000. We will uh, hire a team of five researchers for four days a week, $25 an hour uh, for 90 days and eight hour work days to develop the first prototype for our capsule. Um, planning is $25,000. This is two supervisors that will supervise the entire project and a portion of this part of the budget will go to any miscellaneous or extensions or any other parts of the uh, process. Acquiring materials is $35,000. We will buy from wholesalers and major ph pharmaceutical companies to gather the materials we need to build the first prototype. Um, building it will cost $75,000. We will hire a team of 10 workers working for 30 days to develop a template that will be used on living tissue. Living tissue, being the most expensive part of our budget, will cost $240,000. $100,000 of that will go to the employment, environment, and sanitary conditions for the uh, creating of living tissue. And um, the other $140,000 will go to the development of 12 kilograms of living tissue for, for miscellaneous um, tests and mistakes, and 8 kilograms for the actual testing on the synthetic tissue. Testing on the synthetic tissue will cost $50,000 as we will hire another team of workers who will um, test on the tissue for 30 days to make sure it is viable for human trials. Human trials, being $100,000, will be a team of around seven to eight researchers who will um, test on volunteer subjects, um, about 130 subjects that will each be paid $750 for their testing. 
Double blind trials will be the next step if human trials are deemed successful. And this will be researchers not knowing which medicine they are administering, um, uh, administering to test subjects um, either ADM or non-ADM or synthetic template to see which one is more effective. Um, if double blind trials uh, prove our template successful, we will get approved by the government and then we'll move on to mass production. Mass production will only cost $150,000 because we will only be buying exactly what we need and this will only be for the first wave of production. Distribution costs $150,000 as we will be shipping to major companies like Advil so they can input their medications into our pills. Um, and then any extra parts of the process will be gathered from this extra $50,000 that, you know, for any mistakes. In conclusion, animal-derived medical products have become a mainstream of our society, but have caused many negative effects to people who have used them, whether it be religious preference or physical problems. Governments have already tried to solve this, but there must be a more reliable and safe solution. Without it, people would continue to suffer the negative effects of ADMs. With this grant money, we will be able to develop a new non-animal-derived capsule and be able to safely distribute it across the country for people to use. And with no animals being involved, we would be able to successfully fill the criteria of absolutely no animals being used during development and research. So please, if you wish for people to have a new animal-derived medication that is an alternative to them, this money would make the change in a medical department that we need. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Very much appreciate it. Um, some interesting ideas getting thrown around. I think one of the things I was most interested in is the capsule. So you mean the shell that drugs are delivered in, right? That's an interesting choice. What led you to that decision for this project? Um, well, actually, Mr. Patterson over there uh, helped us create the idea. But um, we thought that making just a normal medication for like headaches or colds and stuff like that isn't inclusive enough as there's plenty of medications that these religious minorities cannot take due to the ge gelatin, dyes, and solutes that they use in capsules that are derived from medicine or animals. So um, we, we created a capsule that uh, companies like Advil can put into their, their medication into the capsule so even the most minor problems can be treated for those minorities. Thank you all so much. Take it away. Our product is on microbial waste management by Delilah, Deacon, Hudson, Connor, and Colin. All right, so a little bit of a history before we get into our proposal. For a long time, um, waste management wasn't really taken seriously. 
and human waste was just kind of thrown on the streets. That was until the ancient Roman Empire where they implemented sewage systems and other waste disposal systems. By creating uh, ditches along the streets, this allowed rain to wash off uh, human waste and topsoil. This created a cleaner and safer environment for all of their civilians. And throughout history, um, waste management continued to evolve up until our proposal. So what our proposal is, is a septic tank attachment, which processes, which using microorganisms processes human waste and turns it into methane gas. This methane gas is then sent into a combustion engine and burned. This burned methane gas is then sent into a turbine, which turns the turbine and creates, creates electricity. With microbial biotech, we can create things like bioseptic tanks, which can be used to power our homes. Bioseptic tanks are a form of wastewater management, and they generate biogases, which can be used as a renewable energy source. They also recycle water. Microbial biotechnology and waste management can be used to confront many environmental issues, such as climate change, current, micro, current waste management, such as landfills, contribute to about 20% of global methane emissions, which is why bioseptic tanks and microbial biotechnology is a much better alternative since it does not pollute the environment, unlike landfills and other current waste management. Some concerns of bioseptic tanks is that they can be sensitive to temperature change, and some concerns of waste management and microbial biotechnology is the small amount of current research there is, social and regulatory acceptance, and safety. So currently there's two major issues that we're trying to solve with our product. That is climate change and pollution. Climate change has been a major problem for a while now. Um, human waste, it produces emissions into the atmosphere which uh, harms the earth. With our product, it will reduce these emissions and instead turn it into a renewable energy source which is electricity. Another major problem is pollution. Human waste creates a lot of uh, pollution and really fills up landfills. With our product, it will reduce the amount of waste put in landfills and instead convert it into electricity. Um, our product is, well, septic tanks are currently used in all, home, all rural homes not connected to city or town water. By utilizing our product, we are able to turn what would previously be waste into electricity and clean, recycled water. Doing so will eliminate pollution and allow users the ability to either choose to use their produced biogas to either power their home with a home generator or send it back to the power company where it will pay for their electric completely. Um, our product consists of three, two chambers and tubes connecting them. So the waste originally goes down into the septic tank where a pump pulls the, mic pulls the waste into the microbe-filled capsule here, and the methane will travel through these tubes up to the chamber where it's held, where it will either be held until the, power, until the electric companies come and take it, or until you use it in your home using a generator. We are going to hire a researcher to research the most effective and efficient microbes to be used in our experiment, in our product. We are going to do six infield experiments with the most effective microbes, and then we are going to implement them into our product. We are going to sell them through already established septic companies in Char Charlottesville, Virginia, and then we will. We hope to have 150 po homes powered by their septic tanks in 2035. In 2040, we will collect the data we've received, and then we will try lobbying our product to be inserted into every every new build home in Central Virginia to help reduce waste and increase eco-friendly options. So here's our budget. It is a five-year plan, and in total, it equals a million dollars. So first of all, we're going to hire a researcher who will help us find like which microbes are the most useful in creating methane, and he will call, uh, they will cost $500,000 in total, which is 100000 a year. 
We will also be renting out a lab which will cost 25000 a year and in total 125000 We will also be installing septic tanks which will be used to test which microorganisms are the most productive. And that will cost 50000 initially for the installation, then 1000 year. We'll also be uh, getting wastewater from the Urbana Water Treatment Plant, and that will cost um, $100,000, uh, not $100,000, $50,000 in total. Um, we're also going to use microorganisms, which have an estimated cost of $70,000. We'll also be spending $100,000 on product development to see how we can make a system more productive. So that could be the combustion engine, anything that helps the system. We'll also be having a $100,000 worth of excess, which will be used to fund any undetermined costs, if there are any. So wastewater has been an issue since the Roman Empire. Microorganisms can be used to treat wastewater and create energy. Our proposal is to create a system which can be added onto a septic tank, which can create energy in rural central Virginia homes. Um, this septic tank will reduce waste, create energy for years to come. We will be asking for a million dollars in order to fund this uh, system. Invest in microbial biotechnology. Invest in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. There certainly is a future for microbial biotechnology out there that feels really untapped. Um, I'm interested, you used the phrase uh, most effective microbes a lot and how you, I, I'm just curious, what parameters are you using to define what makes a more effective microbe? What makes one species of microorganism more effective at this, this job than others? What are your researcher, uh, researchers actually looking for with that? So we want to see which microorganisms create the most methane. So um, I believe they're called methylenogens, something along the lines of that. And they, we want to find which microorganism, microorganism in that category creates the most methane. And I think you hinted on, but I missed it. What if the farmer or the person does not want to use the product? Did you say something about buyback? Uh, septic and uh, energy companies that convert methane gas to actual electricity will buy it back from homes to pay for their electric. Thank you so much.
take it away. Thank you. Um, so orphan disease treatments. So what is an orphan disease? An orphan disease is a disease that is just not profitable for whether reasons that there's not enough people or it's just not enough money to do into the research to get the products out to the people. So that's the main problem with orphan diseases. This is just not enough research and there's just not profitable. So people who are affected by them can't get the treatments that they need. So what people have done and like a general idea is like a one or be all like treatment that will like solve everything and like help people have a treatment, but it's just simply not possible. So we are coming up with an idea that we will do a program through UVA that will help us research into orphan diseases and find out um, better treatments for people who need it. All right, current actions. So after the Orphan Drug Act in 1983, uh, the government and scientists started putting more and more money into funding the, uh, the research as well as developing treatments uh, for orphan diseases. An organization that has been helping with uh, orphan disease treatments is called the Orphan Disease Center. And their whole goal is to raise money as well as find researchers who are willing to help with researching the diseases. And there's a program within the Orphan Disease Center called the Jumpstart Program. And their whole goal is to find researchers as well as connect researchers to patients who are suffering from orphan diseases in order to research orphan diseases as like efficiently as possible and as quick as possible. And the main concern with orphan diseases is the fact that there are only 600 treatments for around the 7,000 orphan diseases there are. The main issue associated with orphan diseases is the lack of treatment that they have. Uh, this lack of treatment is due to the small populations that orphan diseases affect. Uh, this is still a really big issue though because more than 30 million Americans are affected by an orphan disease. Uh, our proposal like for a solution is to add a branch to the UVA hospital. For our overview, we have an artifact. For our overview, um, for our proposal, our goal is to establish a research facility at UVA. They already have many research labs in place and we would be able to use their resources and hospital to our advantage. This is important because, research, because orphan diseases are very underfunded and under-researched, and by establishing a central place, we would be able to have somewhere where people with these diseases could come and get treatment uh, more easily than somewhere else far away. Uh, we chose this because UVA is nearby, and it's a very well-established hospital and college. So people would be able to, people would recognize it, and researchers would be more prone to come here versus a, a new research facility. For our demonstration and proposal, we have an artifact that was sent to you judges via email. It's a document of our email that was sent to the head of researches at UVA. The logistics of our proposal. So to further fulfill our goals of creating more affordable and cheaper treatments for orphan diseases such as cystic fibrosis and Lou Gehrig's disease, we have contacted the head of research and the president of research at UVA, Frederick H. Epstein, and from there we will learn the pricing quote and we will get the availabilities of our researchers, our room for research, and the equipment not only for the research but for experimentation. As our research furthers and our treatments are more getting there to like materialize and get out towards people, we will get them like to be available at cheaper costs and will be available for more people. These orphan disease patients are struggling and will be able to get more treatments that are like out there more as there is less treatments available. Um, so our budget, so starting with the one million, will take 69,426 for paying for the research facilities and including like things that are needed to do the research itself. The $291,200 ah, $291, is going to funding and paying and for our researchers themselves. This is for three years for five different researchers to work on this and work through. The $520,000 is going to the patients who are going to help with like human development. 
that for about half a year during that three-year sequence, and that way we can pay them and have their feedback on what we need and change for our treatments. The 3,250 goes to paying for like this, like the development to getting the products out for the patients that we have. $100,000 is going to buy whatever we will need to make the treatments. What we do for the research, whatever we need, that's what that money is allotted to. $100 is going out for advertisements, whether that's just around and like radio stations to just get people to do or, or like sign up to be a part of the trials, and then also to let people know that this product is now available. And then uh, $16,000 is going into a savings account, $10,000 just to start, and then adding uh, $2,000 each year. That way, we can continue this program even when we can't really be involved as much. That way, the program can continue. And then with interest because of that, we can become more profitable, and we'll spend a lot of money. So today we have come to you with a plan of what we are trying to do for these amount of people, which may seem small compared to the rest of the world. Okay, we have presented a plan to you. We presented what we are trying to do, and I'm supposed to convince you why you should give us this money. And I'm going to do that by relating to you. The biggest problem we have, this world has, with a lot of people not caring about these diseases, is they're like, well, this doesn't affect me, so why should I care? So I'm, I would like to ask you. If it was your husband, your wife, your daughter, your kids, how much money would you be willing to spend to save their life or to give them more time? People are dying. These diseases are ruining their lives, and they aren't able to live on the short amount of time we have on this earth as is. So we are asking you, please, to grant us this money so that we can help them live their lives and for them to be able to enjoy what we are able to do every day. Thank you so much for that and a very emotional appeal. Had a couple questions here, so let me make sure I understand it. The goal of the fund here is you are going to research and look into cures for orphan diseases. Yes, and sir. And you're going to start this wing at UVA? Yes, sir. That's what we were trying to do. Okay, so the Orphan Disease Center's Jumpstart is a fund that already exists, and it essentially seems to do what you describe you're going to do. Can you explain why investors should fund your proposal over just giving money to the Orphan Disease Center's Jumpstart Fund. Well, sir, may I ask you, did you hear about that before today? So, then this is an education uh, No, what I'm trying initiative. to say is, although that they have tried to start do something, they obviously haven't had a lot of success. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to Essentially, like you said, yes, what we are doing seems like they're already trying to do that. But obviously, they haven't had the success that maybe they were wanting to have. So that's why we are trying to come in and essentially, we could possibly work with them, but in order, it would almost be like trying to beat the competition because it seems that they are not getting the job done that they said that they needed to get done. Um, you had a letter you produced for UVA. Did it name any, you named a couple of particular diseases. How did you determine which orphan diseases you're going to focus on? So these two diseases, cystic fibrosis and Lou Gehrig's disease, um, they are two diseases that have active treatments. Well, cystic fibrosis does, but it comes at a very expensive cost. And there are many cystic fibrosis patients that cannot afford this treatment. And so what we would like to do is provide these patients that do not have this treatment available at reasonable costs to produce this with affordable costs that they can get cured with. Lou Gehrig's disease does not have an active treatment, and that's one that we would like to produce one for. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Thanks for uh, waiting on us. Take it away. We did pharmacogenomics. Uh, pharmacogenomics is the study of how that someone's lifestyle and genes affect their response to medicine. The distribution of pharmacogenomics has become a serious problem in the medical field. To solve this problem, we our solution is to create a test kit that we send through the mail to people's home, and they fill it out and do the test and then send us the results so we can analyze them. This will solve the problem of distribution, save money and time, but it will not solve the ethical and uh, misunderstandings of the topic. For example, most people in this room have never heard of pharmacogenomics before this presentation. So to solve this, we will be talking about how it is used, how it will be used, and how it was used in the past. Pharmacogenomics was first uh, discovered by Pythagoras in 400 BC. He discovered it through the fava beans that uh, the fava beans and how they affected uh, certain individuals but did not affect others. In uh, after that, it was not discovered. It was not researched again until 1866 through the rules of heredity. That after that, it had, was discovered and researched until 1957 when uh, the term pharmacogenomics was actually uh, coined by Frederick Vogel. And uh, this was, uh, this is the difference between pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics is pharmacogenomics is a broader form that deals with the whole genome and not just one gene. Our solution will solve we should continue to research pharmacogenomics because it provides structure and we could make better precision medicines for people and to solve disease and illnesses in the future so for the record just how many like Keanu was saying actually know what pharmacogenomics even means because not even my group did we had to learn how to pronounce the word and it's because of the availability. It's not available where, at least where I live, I hardly ever hear about it. It's precision medicine, which is basically the most common term for it. And because of the availability, not many people know about it, like I was saying earlier. And just. Ooh. Uh, the availability causes many people to forget what the word means, and it is really beneficial for 
major treatments like cancer or HIV, it's very beneficial for those. But that's not all what it's used for. In fact, it can be used for many things like depression as well. It's a really beneficial thing. And it's tailored to your specific genomes, because there's billions out there. There's billions of genomes that humans own, well, have, and um, many researchers have put in an, a lot of effort to research these genomes. And by getting testing, which is not available to a lot, which is why we have even created this product, it causes you to find a specific blend tailored to you, which would end a lot of the specific side effects that other drugs that are not tailored to a specific person cause. Currently, drugs are prescribed to people with too little testing. Approximately 77% of prescribed drugs are prescribed based on self-reported illnesses. This lack of research and testing has led to over 2 million hospitalizations and over 100,000 deaths every year due to adverse drug reactions, or ADRs. Pharmacogenomics can help fix this problem and cut ADRs by 30%. Currently, there are some issues, though, with pharmacogenomics, in which it's not very ex excluded. It doesn't, like, it's not very, it's very excluded, and it's way too expensive. With limited genome testing facilities around the world, most being in American and European countries, many people do not have access to these testing facilities. On top of this, one pharmacogenomic test can cost over $2,000, leaving this out of the price range for the already limited number of people with access to this testing. If pharmacogenomics is further globalized, more people will have access to this testing while keeping it in the price range for more people. We've decided that the best course of action for more efficient pharmacogenomic testing would be to mail in tests to patients. This will allow for more testing to get us the data that we need. This would also op open up opportunities to get advertising for pharmacogenomic testing, which could also increase the number of tests and data we get. With these benefits, we could get, we could, with these benefits, we can make a more available system for those who are unable to come in in-person tests. This would also help with funding pharmacogenomic tests, which would allow to have an even bigger budget since it could pay for itself. This is why we should have pharmacogenomic tests um, mailed in. I have an example of a pharmacogenomic test that would be that we could use inside. Inside is a cheek swab that you would swab on your cheek, which would get the genomic properties of the person, which would um, justify your test. Our product is an at-home testing kit, which would be sent by mail to all households in Central Virginia. Before the distribution process can take place, we must seek approval from at least two overseeing companies. The first of these would be CPIC, which is in charge of overseeing and setting boundaries within the realm of pharmacogenomic testing. If all product components are approved by CPIC, we must then seek further approval from the CDC. The CDC is in charge of verifying that all medical tests, drugs, and vaccines are safe for the general public. If our tests are fully approved, we will then begin collecting materials, including test kit inclusions, a factory, a main office, personnel, and even deals with the USPS. From there, tests will be sent out to each household, and the household will be provided the means to take the test and send them back. From there, the test will be sent to a lab where the genome will be sequenced and the correlation between race and results, which will be found in a further questionnaire within the test kits, will be found, as well as certain genes that code for the reactions to certain treatments. These tests provide life-changing insight to not only the individual, but also to many more. These test kits 
limit the barriers of financial and various burdens that keep the availability away from most people. Our test kits are not limited to race, religion, or financial status. In order to start any um, packaging business, you have to rent a building in order to start the assembly. And our building will ideally be about 1,000 square feet, and the cost of that particular building would be about $35,000 per year. And the storage unit that is going to come with it so that we have places to store things is going to be about like $2,000. And then our permit for the building will be about like $1,400. And then moving on, we'll have electricity, HVAC, internet, and insurance in our overhead for the building, which is going to be about $4,500 all combined per year. And for the bathroom installation for our employees, in case like there's not one that comes with the building, it's going to be about $20,000, but that's not per year. And then we're going to have about 10 employees assembling the boxes and or let them to be sent out. And um, each employee is going to be paid about $34,000 and 500 And then if you multiply it by 10 or whatever, it'll make $345,000 per year. And then after that, we're going to have to buy table shares, office like equipment, printers, and software. for like The printer is going to be made for instructions in the DNA tests and so on. And all together, that's going to be about $16,350, which is not a annual or monthly thing and then um, one of our like other very expensive things is going to be our boxes like the paper for the instructions or flies or whatever DNA test and disinfected wipes which is all going to come in the box that we send out and all those together will be about two hundred and five thousand dollars however the DNA tests are the most expensive out of those costing about a hundred like per like DNA test and we're going to sign a agreement or something with CPIC saying that um, since we're sending them the DNA test to them, it's benefiting not only us and the people in Virginia, but them as well. So we're going to get DNA tests for free, which is going to knock off about $100,000 off of our budget. And the only other expense that we have to worry about will be about $3.90 per package that we send out. And we're just going to sign a contract with the mail service. And then um, by the end of it, we'll be advertising flyers and begin manufacturing of our boxes. And that flyers are going to be sent out to kind of promote awareness and so on because there's not enough, not enough people know about it. And the entire span of this is going to be about over like half a year. And the um, total of our budget is going to be about $568,210 for the first year. And we'll be able to knock about $100,000 off of that by the end of it while we, when we sign the CPIC. And it's going to be about 468000 Pharmacogenomic testing is not a very well-known subject. <clears throat> this creates the problem of not being able to test as much as we would like. While some companies have put in a lot of effort to put in lots of programs, we have created a great program that would work to create more pharmacogenomic testing. With putting more knowledge into this subject, we can create a this would provide many benefits to many people since it would allow people from not having an adverse drug reaction, which is fatal. This is why we should be funded so we can have a cheap, strong system for pharmacogenomic testing. Thank you. Thank you so much. On the note of any product or artifact, if you guys, when you show it to us, could just go ahead and bring it over to our table of esteemed judges for our inspection, that would be wonderful. Um, with that in mind, a couple questions, but with us running short on time, I'm going to ask you one in particular. You're asking for funding here. Uh, similar services do exist. For instance, there's 23andMe, which is more about kind of heritage and cultural exchange, and there are some at-home tests that exist for pharmacogenomics, but specifically for your initiative, patient privacy and whether or not that genomic data is publicly available and can be traded and bought by other companies has been a huge concern with this kind of testing. Investors would probably be very curious as to whether you're going to, and I'm going to put this in quotes, leave that money on the table and not sell patient data or if you're going to go for a decision to make that a high priority in your business model. 
Um, so with the instructions and the DNA test that we're sending out, it's also going to come with a survey. And it's going to be asking them like what their environmental like what their environment is like, like what they eat and how that will like affect them. And along that survey, it's going to be like some agreement or whatever, saying like that we're not going to like sell it or whatever. And we're not allowed to do that unless it has to do with CPIC services, because they're going to like they're going to take that information and they're going to use it for the greater good of the people of Virginia so that we can know like what what certain things affect people most, including like what environments most people have. And yeah. You're saying it's going to be an opt-in survey to share that data? Yes. So much. All right, take it away. Hi, we are Group 19 Thyrotherapy. I'm Lyra Tusing. I'm Tyler Crenshaw. I'm Lila Edwards. I'm Lila Kessner. I'm Quinn Fagans. I'm Cameron Giflett. We have been given the chance to receive $1 million to progress an idea of viral therapy. Viral therapy is the use of viruses to kill off harmful pathogens inside the body. Viral therapy is an extremely promising treatment and has been since its early discovery in the early 1900s when, it, when a patient was found with decreasing size in their tumor cells due to, harm, due to the viruses that was contracted with it decreasing its size. Viral therapy is an extremely important topic due to its ability to kill off, kill off tumor cells. So we came together as a group to create an idea of personalizing viruses to help patients that are suffering from cancer. researchers will be able to take the next big step and move into clinical trials. This is projected to happen in the coming years. Some concerns that are currently held about oncolic viruses are mainly for the safety, since oncolic viruses are genetically modified viruses. Luckily, in recent data, it has been shown that it only in extremely rare cases do oncolic viruses harm any healthy cells. The current issue with virotherapy is that the viruses being used in treatment are not working correctly on patients. In current practices, the cancer patient's immune systems are killing the viruses, which leaves the viruses unable to do their jobs of killing the cancer cells. 
There are many variables which can affect how one will react to the viral therapy treatment, such as location and size of the affected area, as well as the type of cancer. Variables such as height and weight can also contribute to how one will react to the viral therapy treatment. More attention needs to be brought to viral therapy specifically because it has the power to cure cancer, which can ultimately be a huge turning point in the medical field. By scanning patients beforehand, correct viruses could be used, which would specifically adjust to a certain cancer based on test results. Patients would be screened by a simple blood test and would get results back within a short period of time. If we could make this happen, then the success rate of biotherapy would increase, as well as the overall chances of battling the disease. In order for us to address the issue of viruses inaccurately working on patients, we would like to propose our plan of action for the most beneficial use of biotherapy. Because each patient has differences in their immune system and type of cancer, it is necessary for us to incorporate the personalization of viruses. Our main goal is to develop a screening process. This screening process will allow us to determine how to modify the viruses based on a person's health. To achieve this, we will be partnering with the Cancer Department at the University of Virginia. Within the Cancer Department, we will screen patients and categorize them. We will test many different modifications of viruses on different types of tumors and immune systems. This will allow us to develop a more organized level of knowledge on how to um, pair a virus with um, a person. So. Um, this is very important because the use of biotherapy has a very strong potential within the medical field. By taking these actions, we will be able to produce a very effective and stable form of treatment. Another thing we would like to focus on is making this treatment available to a larger group of people. Within eight months, we hope to have conducted enough research and testing to send patients through the process. Eventually, we hope to implement the process into local clinics and doctor's offices. Our plan is especially attractive because it is straightforward and it will have a greater effect than any other previous adjustments in the medical field. This is not just an, an idea. It is an advancement to the treatment of cancer. If we are given the proper amount of funding, the personalization of cancer-specific virotherapy will be definitely manageable. Now let's talk about the logistics. To implement this idea, we will start by reaching out to the University of Virginia Center for Hematology and Oncology. This is a division with the new VA School of Medicine that focuses on treatments for diseases relating to the blood and cancer research. This would be the perfect place to base our research because we could build off of their blood tests and cancer tests. From early December 2023 to early August 2024, we will start the process of developing our idea and the mechanics of it. A major area of research during this time period will be figuring out what viruses we will use and how we will modify them. After we come up with a viable way of screening patients and modifying viruses, we will then start the process of testing it. To do this, we will have the FDA approve a program in which we use our tool to treat cancer patients. The mechanics of this program will be, will be worked out over a month. And in October 2024, the program will go into action. We will very carefully monitor the patient's symptoms and the reaction of their cancer to the treatment. Then, based on the data, we will make the necessary modifications to improve the efficiency of our idea. In early 2025, we hope to start implementing our idea in the cancer treatment centers. Our goal for this tool is to increase the efficiency of viral therapy and reduce the complexity of balancing all the variables when modifying viruses. If we can come up with another viable solution when treating cancer patients, then we'll consider ourselves successful. Sorry. So first out of the million dollars of the grant money, we'll spend on $130,000 on blood tests. And that includes the equipment to actually run blood tests and analyzing the blood itself. Second, we'll spend around a third of our budget, $325,000, on hiring multiple workers that we need to actually work on the program. First, we need a virologist and an oncologist for their knowledge on cancers and viruses. And we need a physician to actually be a part of the program because of the FDA's Right to Try program, or ACT. 
The FDA's Right to Try Act states that anyone who gives informed consent can receive experimental treatment as long as a physician is part of the program. Additionally, we have a researcher that will be running tests to see what kind of viruses are effective for certain cancers and what proteins in the viruses can be used, modified for the actual treatment. Uh, these, tr these wage costs are based on four hours a day for five days a week for a year. Now, the most expensive part of our budget is the replication, delivery, modification, and storage of our viruses. And that totals around $425,000. The virus modification especially is an extremely expensive process because we're working on such a small scale and uh, it's very expensive to actually modify the genes and delete on, on such a small scale. So the delivery includes anything that we need to actually deliver the viruses, of course. And once the viruses are in the system, they'll be uh, ta attacking tumor cells and potentially producing an anti-tumoral response in the body through the immune system. Replication, the virus needs to be kept in a specific environment, and we also need to provide some kind of host cell because viruses can't replicate on their own. And for vi viral storage, we, uh, viruses need to be kept in very specific environments in order for them to still retain their usefulness, especially when we're modifying viruses and we need the, the specific usefulness for specific proteins. Uh, so we've also dedicated $110,000 for the actual research section and we've dedicated $25,000 to the general equipment and that includes screening technologies, microscopes, and anything else that's related to uh, letting our program uh, be known, I guess, in UVA and on, on the internet. So in this case, UVA would cover the cost of the building, which includes utilities, electricity, and anything else that might be related to owning or renting a building. Uh, that our to grant total is a million dollars, and uh, we hope that you accept this. In conclusion, cancer-specific virotherapy is one of the most important causes to the medical world. The cancer screening process that would be developed with the proper funding would allow us the opportunity to start treating patients on a significantly larger scale. As previously stated, the potential behind virotherapy is astronomically large, and um, with the, with the proper funding and tools, we would be able to begin treating patients everywhere and giving them the correct screening and correct treatment options despite their situations, making the whole idea more inclusive and ideal for all. Being able to reach and screen individuals will also improve the success rates of this treatment method, as well as allow us to look further into discovering potential cures. However, none of this will be possible without the proper funding but we believe that this cause is by far one of the most important causes to be able to receive it. In conclusion, this cancer-specific screening will allow us to change the medical world as we know it and will allow us to turn corners that we've never seen behind before. So please allow us the chance to make a change and create a brighter future for the virotherapy and cancer treatment world. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm quite interested in your central premise. So the overwhelming issue seems to be that an appropriate virus is being sent into a body, it's been modified, and then that virus can selectively target cells. Am I correct on that? Okay, so then the issue comes in, how do you get a human body to recognize a virus as a, quote, good virus? Um, you're talking about screening. I think this is great. What are you planning on screening for exactly? I don't think I caught that in your presentation. Um, so we're going to run blood tests and uh, cancer tests. To, so each person has like a different immune system and like the strength of their cancer and stuff. So as you're modifying viruses, um, the immune system can sometimes kill them. And so they have to be weak enough so that the immune system isn't going to target them. But they also have to be strong enough to get into the tumors. And so we're thinking of running a screening process to like personalize the viruses to specific people. Yes. Um, help me understand, what are you screening for? What sort of markers are you looking for to see how you match virus to patient? So um, you, can, you can test the, pl the blood to look at the strength of the immune system. And then also, um, we're going to use already input uh, cancer tests and hopefully improve upon them to like, learn what we can specifically modify the virus. Thank you so much.
Take it away. Hello, our presentation is on genetic modification in agriculture. I'm Rylan. This is Aiden, Robert, Waken, Audrey, and Rachel. To give a little background information, genetic modification is whenever the genes of an organism is specifically modified. This is used a lot in agriculture and food production. Our proposal is that to stop the spread of misinformation about genetic modification and GMOs, we are going to build a research center par by partnering with Virginia Tech and a Virginia education system to spread awareness of our topic. Genetic, mod genetic modification has the potential to change the world and it's doing so as we speak. <laughs> Living Carbon is a company that is using genetic modification to increase the biomass of trees to produce more oxygen and obtain more carbon. That can be used to solve climate change, and if not solve it, it can be used to greatly help. Edible vaccinations are another potential thing that genetic modification can do, because with genetic modification, you can alter the proteins in a plant to produce vaccinations. Alfalfa seems to be the best choice for this so far, and it can also increase crop production. So far, it has increased corn production by 10%, soybean production by 5%, and cotton production by 19%. With the population reaching 8 billion as of one year ago, by 2050, it will reach 9.8 billion, and we will need to increase crop production by 60%. Genetic modification can help that. The compelling issue with genetic modification in agriculture is the fact that there's so much misinformation spread about it. Um, people often uh, lie and say that they can, they can be unhealthy and cause health risks. People even believe that if you eat genetically modified foods, um, then the genetic mod genetically modified gene will then pass on into your human generative cells and pass on into further generations. The IRT, which is an institute for respons responsible technology, uh, reported after 10 days of feeding rats GMO potatoes, virtually every organ system uh, had adversely changed. Um, they also stated that the toxicity of the potatoes was the entire cause of this and the main reason. Um, many groups like the anti-GMO advocacy group IRT um, lie and say that they are very unhealthy for you. Um, and a lot of people do not know a lot of, about uh, GMOs, so they are easily let on by just basic things people say about it. Um, according to the National Library of Medicine, 54% of people either know very little about genetic modification or they know nothing about it. And this is exactly why uh, this, there should be something that can be easily accessed like the proposal that we have. So with all this misinformation about GMOs, how do we convince people that it's not true? Well, how about a research and information center? This research and information center will have real scientists doing real research on real GMOs and have this information open to the public. This will spread awareness about the good of GMOs and how the bad of GMOs just isn't true. It's also going to be um, having volunteers from Virginia Tech, which will also be providing the grounds for what we're going to build this on. And we're um, partnering with the Virginia Board of Education to have field trips here and educate students about GMOs. Okay, so our artifact is um, a physical blueprint of what our information center will look like. And so on the main floor, this is going to be the one that's open to the public. And it has an area where they can watch a video about the science behind genetic modification as well as our mission here. And there's also an area where there's a display of different um, genetically modified organisms and food. And then the bottom floor is the research center where we'll have uh, researchers and scientists who are discovering things about genetic modification that they'll share with the people who come and visit. OK, so we're going to receive funding partly through this grant, but also when we partner with Virginia Tech. And our information center will be located on one of the farms where they have their Virginia Agricultural 
experiment station, specifically the McCormick Farm, because that is the closest one to all of us. And uh, we hope that this will be, this information is going to be up and built in one to two years, but this could change depending on weather conflicts or issues with construction. So our goal is to have um, 500 to 1,000 people in the first month. Um, this is around 15 to 30 people a day if we're open on the weekends as well as the weekdays. Um, if we reach this goal, we'll know that our idea was successful because this is a large portion of people who are learning about genetic modification and hopefully um, stopping the spread of misinformation surrounding genetic modification. Okay, so for our budget, um, construction of the information center would be around $550,000 for like both boys and stuff. Um, researchers and stuff like that would be $220,000. And then furnishing for the things such as tables, chairs, desks, stuff like that would be around fifty thousand. Uh, caretakers for the animals and plants would be around sixty-four thousand uh, dollars. Janitors would be around sixty thousand dollars as well. Um, and then utilities would be around fifteen thousand eight hundred seventy-seven dollars. And in conclusion, total of all that would be nine hundred fifty-nine thousand eight hundred seventy-seven dollars for the construction and running of our research center. Okay, so our main points are that we're creating a genetic modification information center to help lessen the spread of misinformation surrounding genetic modification. We should be funded because we can, uh, with this center, we can help um, lessen the spread of genetic modification because people will learn about genetic modification and take this knowledge home to their friends and family, which will be even more people who understand what genetic modification really is. All right. All right, thank you so much. So what we have here is an education center, right? Can I ask what your target demographic is? Who is, who are you hoping shows up to this? Well, since we are centered at Virginia Tech, who is greatly focused on agriculture, we're hoping to influence the next generation of workers and educators who are going into that field. And by sponsoring field trips with the Virginia education system, we're also hoping to educate younger children so that like the next generation who's going to inherit the earth will know what this is really about. So it sounds like families and field trips. Is that my right on that? Yes. So then what sorts of activities, displays, or exhibits do you have that's going to make a family say, come on, kids, we're off to the GMO education center? Well, we are going to have active GMO crops and cattle fields, along with interactive displays and um, so it'll be like a genetically modified petting zoo. Um, will you be serving any food at this place? Well, it depends on the times we're open, and we have considered it um, greatly because genetic modification is used so much in the field, like not the field of food production. So yes, we will be offering food such as like lunch and brunch options. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, gang, we're going to take a teachers. The judges are taking a two minute break. You guys stay put. You can chat a little bit and we'll let you know when things are kicking back up.
Take it away. So our group is Stem Cell Therapy. My name is Amber. This is Shelby, Brooke, Caitlin, Alex, and Bailey. And then Autumn couldn't be here today. Imagine a medical procedure that has the ability to both increase survival rate and decrease the negative effects that those who are affected by the ailments from ranging to flesh wounds, neurodegenerative diseases, and cancer. Stem cell therapy can reduce the negative effects that are caused by these by using, their, by using their unique properties of regeneration and differentiation to replace necrotic and damaged stem cells and replace the tissue, as well as promote growth. This therapy effectively transforms the way that we, we view the field of regeneration and has already improved over a million lives, as stated by the Leukemia Foundation and has proved to be effective since as early as the 1950s when bone marrow transplantations and hematopoietic transplantations were used to save victims of nuclear bombings during World War II. Due to these reasons stated above and the immense prospect of this field, we have decided to implement a clinic specifically dedicated to the process and research of stem cell therapy honing in on, the, on hematopoietic cells in hopes to broaden our knowledge and increase, to increase our knowledge and improve this field. Okay, so currently in America, we're trying to figure out how stem cells will react with your body after you get stem cell therapy, because there's a possibility that once you get stem cell therapy and the stem cells are in your body, they will react negatively with your original cells and it can make you sick and this isn't like a like deathly illness. It's more like when you get a flu shot, and then after that, it can make you sick and make you have a cold. But um, it's just we're trying to make sure that it's not going to damage your body super badly and cause future um, problems. And also, our government is starting to warm up to stem cell therapy a little bit more because in the past, we used to use um, embryonic cells, and that be can be a political and touchy subject for just personal matters and also religious matters but we have found new ways to do stem cell therapy by taking stem cells from bone marrow and also taking stem cells from fat tissue called adipose tissue. And we can use that the same way as embryonic cells. And you can see this um, kind of warming up to stem cell therapy. If you go to colleges and like prominent nursing colleges, you can see them doing stem cell clinics in them and also practicing stem cell therapy to help um, excess knowledge. Since we don't have a group member today, she has pre-recorded the video, but there will be a little couple points I will touch on right afterwards. Stem cell therapy Apologies. in the U.S. And we as a group believe the most pressing issues of regenerative therapy are the availability and the affordability. There is not much acknowledgement of stem cell therapy in the U.S. because people don't know what it is. This is because stem cell therapy is not talked about very much anymore. But... Stem cell therapy can treat and cure cancers such as leukemia and lymphoma, which contributed to the deaths of about 57,000 people in the U.S. in 2023 alone. Stem cell therapies that are available can range from $5,000 to a hefty $50,000. And our grant proposal covers both of these issues and can really help people who are interested in regenerative medicines as treatments. On the presentation, you can see these little red location markers. They are places in the U.S. that where there are stem cell clinics. And these little blue stars right here are where they are most at in more dense populations. Now, since this video is pre-recorded, there are some things that I'd like to touch on. First off, you may notice that all of the dense like populations of clinics are in Arizona. Flo hmm? I continue. In Arizona, and especially Florida and up in New York, these clinics are incredibly expensive. 
And I know for in the Arizona, travel costs will often eat up a huge portion of a budget that a family or a trust might have for a patient. In Florida, all of Florida is incredibly densely populated, which means that the medicine there is much more expensive than it would be if you traveled elsewhere. And finally, for clinics that are nearby, much of them are in hospitals that only treat to patients that are currently in said hospitals, like the Kennedy Krieger Institution. These clinics, not every single one of them is openly available. Very few of them are. It is, stem cell medicine is incredibly exclusive. Uh, keeping these issues in mind, we plan to open up a stem cell clinic in Gainesville, Virginia, where people can come and receive stem cell therapy. Now, it's important that we advertise that this location is available to people, so if they choose to get stem cell therapy, they know that this place is where they can go to receive it. Now, we have a flyer that we made which will tell the people the days of the week that they can come and the hours of during the day that they can come receive therapy, and just a little more information about what stem cell therapy is so they can make an informed decision if they want to come to our clinic. Now, fundraising is important because stem cell therapy is, also, is a very expensive medical procedure. So we will be uh, proposing a fundraising thing that uh, fundraising that is similar to the own organization called Baking Memories for Kids, which is where they sell bakes at, uh, baked goods that uh, fund uh, vacations for people, for children who are sick. And we uh, will be using the proceeds for uh, our baked goods to um, to help fund the medical bills that these families will receive. For the demonstration of our proposal, we have two artifacts with us. We are using the same fundraising method as Baking Memories for Kids, which is a charity that I have been involved with in the past. They sell fundraiser goods, such as cookies, brownies, etc., to the general public to fund full treatments and vacations for these children. Additionally, we have a flyer over there, which, do we have one over here? We have a flyer of the clinic listing its hours, its times, and its location for the families that need them. We have the flyer. The flyer has the, all of the lists on it of approved stem cell medicines, fundraising for medical bills, and improvement in regenerative therapy as a whole. So the next step in our plan would be to uh, first work on this clinic for about six months, maybe renovating it, having workers come in and help with all of the, uh, the work that needs to be done to make this place into a clinic. Uh, this building is at Heritage Hunt Building Suite, and it, it's uh, 1,903 feet. And this place obviously needs to be renovated to be fully opened as a clinic. So for six months, we will be fundraising with, with the cookies and working on getting our workers, getting uh, the doctors needed for it. Uh, we would work on getting all of the equipment, all of the uh, certain, like, all of the rooms ready. And then once it opens, we would be working from uh, 10 to 5, six days a week, but our doctors would only be coming in for 10 to 1. And so if this clinic is to be successful, we would have to make sure our patients are being treated correctly, their treatments are working, and that we are able to keep uh, paying our workers, upkeeping the place, and making sure everything is neat and orderly. When thinking about the budget for this proposal, there's a lot to think about. Some of the main points that came to mind were finding a place to rent, um, hiring medical hematologists, hiring researchers, the equipment and the cost of the equipment for the therapy, and fundraising. For a place to rent, we found a office space in Gainesville, Virginia, that's 1,903 square feet for $4,361 a month. This would come out to be about $51,612 a year. For medical hematologists, which are the people that perform stem cell therapy, they get paid about $182 an hour. Um, so if we paid two medical hematologists to work four hours a day, six days a week, this would come out to be about 
$419,000 for two of them. For the researchers, we would pay them $35 an hour. We would hire three of them to work eight hours a day for six days a week. Um, and this would come out to be about $241,900 for three of them per year. For the equipment cost, I found an itemized list of what we would need off of the National Institute of Health. Um, and after adding up the cost of everything, it came out to be about $114,000 to $115,000 for everything that we would need. For fundraising, there was a lot of things that we circled around, which we ended up landing on cookies, which wouldn't cost too much. And then we also are going to hire a marketing manager and pay them $50 an hour. And that would come out to $115,200 a year. And we would also have a TV ad for $50,000 a year, and a statewide commercial. And um, after any, any other additional costs would go towards any other fundraising or anything else that we would need. And we would have about $7,700 left over after all of those costs. In conclusion, stem cells are one of the most promising areas of medicine that is currently being researched. Regenerative therapy has the potential to help with all sorts of diseases, from traumatic brain injuries to cancers to various forms of flesh wounds, using the unspecialized cells that come in stem cells. The tissues that are used, such as adipose and bone marrow tissue, are ethically funded after much controversy in the early 2000s. However, one of the biggest bars to stem cell therapy is the cost and the lack of information associated with it, which is why we propose opening our clinic. It would allow much easier available medicine for those who need it and might not have the funds to go to a clinic out in Arizona or Florida away from their families and away from their home. We have the logistics. All we need is the grant money to get this clinic started. This could truly improve the lives of people who need this kind of therapy which is why we propose that we should have the money to open this clinic. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you're talking about bringing a stem cell clinic here to the area. I believe the closest ones, did you pick up on that in your research, where the closest stem cell clinic is? Uh, the closest, if I remember correctly, is in Richmond. That's exactly what I found too. Excellent. Um, so that's a, definitely a worthy goal. Um, you're specifically talking about dealing with the prohibitively high costs that stem cell therapy brings for patients. How exactly is the clinic going to address those concerns as a long-term and sustainable part of its business model? I know you mentioned um, selling cookies. I think that can definitely be a part of it, but I do question how much of a dent the cookies would make in terms of lowering stem cell treatment costs. You also mentioned other fundraising. Could you just kind of expand on the business model, making it cheaper, and what these other fundraising ideas were? Uh, other fundraising, there's always just actual fundraisers, like events that we could set up at hotels like the Best Western that would go to specifically raise money. We the Cookies idea, which is probably the most baseline, would help raise help pay for the treatment to these families specifically in medical costs. The grant itself would provide a coasting until the clinic becomes self-sufficient, where we can set up more events around the state via rallying, fundraising, um, and other sorts of monetary gain. Thank you so much.
take it away. So our topic is on 3D bioprinting in organ transplants. I'm Kason, this is Danny, Daniel, Ellie, Charles, and Tommy. So our proposal is to open a bioink research department at Sintera Martha Jefferson Hospital in Charlottesville. The research department will research the use of bioink to help create, to help, um, which will help also help create vascular networks and organs, which is needed to keep the organs alive. 3D bioprinting became prominent when researchers realized they could use it to create functional organs that can be used in transplants. And our goal is to obviously create, help create functional organs to uh, save lives, which is also why 3D bioprinting is important. Many large companies have already begun implementing new methods of 3D bioprinting. Pandorum, which is based in India, is among these companies. Um, their discoveries are quite astounding, having been able to create artificial uh, liver tissues. These liver tissues have the ability to fully emulate um, human liver functions. And um, they also have the potential to one day be able to create uh, fully functioning artificial livers. One compelling issue on the topic of uh, 3D printing organ transplants is its incredible difficulty to print something that works long term inside the human body. So far, many people have tried to print, but nothing has lasted uh, long term, which is more why we need more research in the materials that go into printing the uh, 3D printed organs. Uh, the, the quicker we can get a material that uh, functions in the body long term, the more people can be saved from the organ transplant wait list, which is where people go who need organs from other people. And so that the wait on the wait list can take months and if not years, and many people actually die just waiting for the organs that in the near future can just be printed in a matter of hours. So as my colleagues have previously stated, our, pr our proposal is to build a new wing in the Martha Jefferson Hospital dedicated to the production and development of 3D bioprinting, but majorly focused on bioinks. Bioinks are basically the filament of what make up a 3D printed organ. It is important to further develop the bioink because it is what makes the organ actually function. And the more that it is fully developed, the closer we can get to making them fully vascularized and work in the human body without any help from an outside source. So the reason we chose Martha Jefferson Hospital is because when compared to other hospitals in Virginia that are local, it is completely overshadowed by hospitals like UVA, which are uh, student learning hospitals. And if we put a new department in Martha Jefferson, it will not only attract attention to Martha Jefferson, but also to our new research department. OK, so as far as logistics are concerned, starting right now in November, we would be sending this letter out. This is actually our artifact to Martha Jefferson Hospital. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to be sending it to you. Um, and hoping that they would accept it and get, you know, we would receive their permission to start construction there along with them. We would be partnered also in November immediately. So within that next year, the following year of 2024, we would begin construction with Martha Jefferson as all of the construction costs and renovation costs would be covered in the grant proposal, as said before, and finishing construction in November 2026, approximately three years after the initial like receival of the grant. And we would know that uh, we would know that our facility is, you know, successful when we are getting viable results from the testing that's being done there. And we're like, yeah, that's it, actually, sorry.
So for the estimated cost, it's split into three main categories, which is the necessary instrumentation, the hospital renovation costs, and the federal documentation required for creating a medical research facility. So for the instrumentation required, we would need a benchtop chemistry analyzer, which is used for analyzing an enzyme's effect on its substrates. And its relevance would be the fact that it can determine the functionality of the 3D printed tissue. To its right, you have a uh, floor model chemistry analyzer, which does a very similar thing to the previous, but it uh, does it better, more efficiently, and can handle larger sample sizes, which is why we'd have two of them, because uh, a lot of times, a research lab such as this would have multiple samples, which some more time sensitive than the other, which they could use to their respective uh, instrumentation. To its right, there is a PCR machine, which stands for polymerase chain reaction, which uh, isolates DNA and RNA segments in an organism, which would be used for one, uh, getting the DNA to create tissue uh, based on that DNA as well as getting the DNA out of the bioprinted tissue to compare to the, uh, the original DNA to see for any mutations. After that, there is an automatic extra automated extraction system, which is used for uh, purifying DNA, RNA, proteins, and cells, which is uh, useful because it allows for the um, uh, scientists or researchers to analyze the structure and functionability of the cell itself. Underneath of that is the um, uh, liquid chromatography and spectrometry system, which is uh, which allows for the uh, molecular diagnosis of diseases, which is useful. So you could determine uh, hereditary diseases or genetic disorders that are passed down as cells replicate and die. Also, we would need a bioprinter for a uh, bio research lab as well as repurposed uh, office printers that their inkjets can be used and replaced as uh, bio inkjets, as well as other modifications, which could be used as cheaper ways as bio printers, as well as general medical equipment right here, which uh, that just includes microscopes, uh, safety equipment, stuff like that, as well as the uh, instrumentation costs, which is roughly $550,000 you would need hospital renovation costs, which comes out to around uh, $350,000 due to $350 per square foot of a research facility. Our research facility would be roughly 1,000 square feet due to the instrumentation and the people needed in the lab. And finally, the uh, federal documentation required, which is a CLIA, a federal document managed by the CDC, would oversee and um, manage the process of creating a lab, otherwise it would be illegal to do so without one. Which brings the total estimated cost to roughly $896,000, or $100,000. And I'm sure you're wondering what about the workers who would be there. But other than advertising, we wouldn't have to manage any of their uh, salaries due to the fact that they'd be employed under Santera Martha Jefferson. So in conclusion, the addition of a 3D bio ink like facility in Martha Jefferson Hospital would not only reduce the waiting time that people are being put on wait lists for these organ transplants that they might be dying for uh, because they could be printed in a matter of hours. Uh, but the only way you could do that is if you have reliable bio inks, which we do not have right now. So if we were you to get the grant money for this and build this facility, it would allow us to not only for the research on bio inks, but it would allow us to implement them into 3D organs, put them in an organic environment, see how they do, and then hopefully get them into people, take away that waiting list time. Um, and also, we think that we should receive the grant money because we believe that human lives are above anything else. And if you're able to save more of them in a shorter amount of time with this innovation, then we should do so. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. A couple clarifying questions that we've got over here. Um, so you're creating a research department. You're hoping to improve the use of bio ink. Uh, you seem to have a pretty firm grasp on the challenges that creating and utilizing this bio ink is. Are you hoping to create a new bio ink, or is the plan to modify an existing one and improve upon it? OK, so hydrogels and cells are the two things that comprise a bio ink, typically. So improving hydrogels and their longevity in the human body is what we're doing. So essentially creating a new one, because the old ones that we're using right now aren't really
doing what we want them to do. So mostly creating a new one. So then if you're talking about creating a new one, that can be prohibitively cost expensive. Did you just consider, and this isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer, just something to think about, the um, cost difference between acquiring maybe a proprietary recipe from another existing bio ink company that maybe is close but not quite there versus creating a new one. Have you considered that cost benefit analysis? Yes. So UVA also has a biomanufacturing department, which is one of the reasons that we are working with Santera Martha Jefferson, due to the fact that they're very close proximity to each other, as well as the fact that um, the total uh, estimated cost is not is only roughly nine hundred thousand dollars, so they would still have about a hundred thousand dollars banked for any extra costs, such as ones that you mentioned. Thank you so much. Take it away. Hi, friends. How are y'all doing? I'm kidding. I don't care. So this is our presentation on antibiotic resistance and microbiomes. I'm Tiger. This is Emma. That's Dylan. That's Jojo. And that's Jennifer. Oliver will not be presenting with us today. Antibiotic resistance, what happens when bacteria becomes resistant to the antibiotic designed to kill it. It first arose in the 1940s. However, it has become more an issue in recent years. This is mainly due to the fact that the public is not aware of the dangers and threats that antibiotic resistance holds. Our proposal is to create a public service announcement, or PSA, and then we will sample and test microbiomes in humans. Microbiomes are groups of micro microorganisms, such as fungi, viruses, and bacteria. We plan to use the PSA um, to educate the public about the dangers of antibiotic resistance, um, and then sam it will hopefully um, encourage people to volunteer to be sampled and tested. Um, we believe that if antibiotic resistance is not treated soonly, um, then it will become more of an issue in future years. There are many different plans across the world to combat antibiotic resistance. In the U.S., we use the National Action Plan. In 2015, the CDC launched the National Action Plan to prevent, detect, and control antibiotic-related illnesses. In 2016, Congress gave the plan $160 million for researching purposes. The plan is structured in five-year-long stages with annual reports each year. Along with this plan, the CDC also releases this information to the public so that people can help protect themselves. 
Some people are skeptical of this plan, though, because it will lead to an increased amount of medical um, medical billing and longer hospital stays. Our issue is the growing concerns of antibiotic resistance. Um, we will institute this by proposing a public service announcement. Um, the public service announcement will consist of a boxing match um, where the, yeah, <laughs> the bacteria will lose the first two rounds, and then um, the antibiotic will lose the last round, where the bacteria gains resistance in the third round. Um, we are instituting this because um, antibiotic resistance, resistance is becoming a global health concern, and the mortality rate is steadily rising. We need to institute this to grant, grant further education to children, and the medical field becomes sometimes doctors often um, administer the wrong medication when dealing with certain ailments but due to misinformation and going off of what they think they should do without consulting their peers. I will be reading Oliver's part since he's not able to present. Our next step proposal is to use the PSA to inform the public of the dangers of antibiotic resistance. We plan to make a video illustrating what we can do to stop antibiotic resistance. The remaining funds and ones potentially generated from the video will be used for the sampling of bacteria to test if it's resistant. The sampling will be done under the Resistance Protection Group, or RPG. The secondary goal of the RPG is to assist re in research for treatment of resistant bacteria. Our plan is to inform the public as well as testing bacteria to see if any new adaptations have occurred. These both will give us new information and how to move forward with antibiotic resistance. We will begin operations in Central Virginia, but will expand if extra resources are available. And the project produces good results. So in more specifics, or in more specific terms, um, we're going to start off by presenting the PSA to the public for about two months. And during those two months, we're going to have a, or, um, a temporary testing location for the people who get their microbiome sampled. Once those two months are over, the video is still going to be shown. And it's going to be on pretty much any um, streaming service possible. So whether that be like just normal TV, YouTube, anything with ads, it's going to be there. Um, once we have that bit of time, which is just to get people to like, you know, know that we're doing that, once that bit of time is over, then we're going to move to a more permanent location, which is going to be set up in a warehouse. And this is where RPG, our group that is, you know, doing all the testing and everything, in case you forgot, um, that's where they're going to be operating. So as was previously said, they're going to be doing testing. They're going to be analyzing the samples. They're going to be testing for resistance and mutations in microbiome, or, yeah, in microbiomes, but specifically in the microorganisms. Um, so that's going to be happening there. And we would like to be able to, if this gains traction, to be able to spread this out. Um, because for now, the warehouse that we have set up is going to be in Fredericksburg. So it's going to be local to Central Virginia. Um, but yeah. For our proposal, we will ask for $976,658. First, we will need to advertise our proposal, and we will be doing so through cinematic advertisements, which is going to be our PSA. Uh, we will do it by broadcasting on television, YouTube, social media, as well as print out paper copies of our advertisement, which will be through flyers and newspapers. Then we will start with the actual microbiome testing. Um, we were sampling and testing the gastrointestinal microbiome, also known as the gut microbiome. So we will need to provide stool tests. We want to give out these stool tests for free for our volunteers or customers. And these tests will undergo microscopic, microbiological, chemical examinations, which will cost around $200 each. We will need to set up tools for our tests, which will consist of a compound light microscope costing around $19,220. $236 each. Then we will need to hire employees for our team, and we plan on hiring three employees, uh, each with a starting salary of $40,000 a year, which 
will end up with 1,200, 100 to, okay. Then all our results will be mailed back to our customers via USPS with their standard size rectangular envelope starting at 66 cents per envelope. All other office supplies, including printer, printer ink, and paper and computer, everything will be about $10,000. This will lead to a price of two, yeah, 226 $226,659. We'll then need a place to actually do the examinations and we will do it in a warehouse located in Fricksburg on 10950 on Pearson Drive. And all this will end up with a grand total of $976,658. Um, Oliver's not here, so I'm gonna read um, the clue for the conclusion. Antibiotic resistance is becoming a major problem in recent years. Our proposal to remediate the issue is to create a PSA to inform the public about antibiotic resistance. We plan to fund a video uh, depicting what we are attempting to do and use the resources garnered from said video to test for antibiotic resistance. We will start in Central Virginia, but potentially expand our expenditures, and we will equate to roughly $960,000 initially, with bulk of the cost coming from bought property and advertisements. Our proposal is fairly costly, but we will help kickstart kick more research against antibiotic resistance, which is long overdue. Oh. We're not done yet. My father was a simple microbe. He attacked cells when he could, but my mother, she abandoned us. She left when I was young, and it was just me and my father. Wah, wah. Yeah, well, uh, growing up, my father was hard on me. I was often self-destructive behaviors. I had a lot of self-destructive behaviors, and I trained to the very end. And I wish they would let me that story so I could end you. I would end you if you ever tried something like that. You should really try bacteria, you really should. I'm not saying I would fight you. I'm saying I would end you. You act like I'm gonna sit here and let you end me. <sighs> you don't even have a choice. You're scared, coward, and don't even have the guts. You should give up now and I'll spare you the night of the fight. The night of the 15th! See you on the 15th, coward. <laughs>
So as you can see, our um, artifact was our video for our PSA, and we hope that when we use that in our proposal, it informs people about the dangers of antibiotic resistance. All right, the following contains depictions of antibiotic on bacteria virus that some audiences might not find suitable, so keep that in mind. Um, excellent work. I did have a couple questions. Uh, love the video. Um, you talked about testing the microbiome of an individual for antibiotic resistance. I'm correct on that, right? Yes. Okay. I noticed in your budget that all the lab equipment I noticed was a compound light microscope. Is that all that's needed to determine the resistance of bacteria to an antibiotic, or was there additional uh, requests for other laboratory materials I missed in your budget? I didn't get that far. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that it's just the compound light microscope. And like, oh, I forgot to get like Petri dishes and stuff. Um, and this is will be through like stool tests, which I also mentioned. Um, and we'll just be looking at the stool under um, the, micro, the microscope. So I figured that's all we needed. Thank you so much. All right, chat. Take it away. Hello, my name is Caroline, and this is Maxwell, Liana, Nathaniel, Autumn, and Brighton. And we are here to represent innovations in the bio-based products industry. According to the UN, about 400 million tons of plastic are globally produced every year. In addition, did you know that about, that about 1.8 billion tons of plastic are what is responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. We are constantly bombarded with headlines and statistics such as these telling us what we always do wrong in our bioeconomy, but never what we can do right. We can't boycott big oil companies or, or, or control manufacturing practices of big corporations, so what can we do? Introducing Cyclum Initiative. We are bringing bio-based products to you. Cyclum Initiative revolutionizes the way that, that organic bio-based products are utilized and managed. 
in regards to what the government is doing about bio-based products, uh, the U.S. Uh, government has implemented many uh, programs such as the BioPreferred program, which allows companies to uh, select uh, from a category or a catalog of bio-based uh, products that are officially recognized in companies that they can order and then have them delivered to their inventory as well as the um, UVA has also had uh, many different uh, programs that also implement uh, bio-based products and bio-based materials into their uh, category of education, as you can get a degree in that. In, uh, which leads us to our compelling issue, which is the popularity between uh, non-bio-based materials and uh, bio-based materials. Bio-based materials are more le like lesser known and less used, are more commonly like expensive uh, to their alternative non-bio-based product, which is like quote unquote more reliable, more known, and less expensive. So our our goal is to change that, which we would do by implementing it into local uh, stores, convenience stores, and restaurants in the forms of polyatic acid, which is a biodegradable uh, material that we can use to replace the common plastic uses of cutlery and bags and other common plastic uses in the stores. So we will be providing um, small businesses or family-owned restaurants with uh, various forms of takeout cutlery. And, um, and most of these uh, cutleries will be just based off of like and produ produced with um, bio-based materials. And we'll be getting the majority of our um, of our the, of the resources necessary from our local farmers and their excess corn stalks. And in return, we'd be offering the farmers a uh, a percentage of the profits we make from each sale, which would be about 10%. And um, and we plan on selling our products to most, if not all, of the um, of the small restaurants near us and uh, with our products they'll be producing significantly less waste since our products are um, since our products are both biodegradable as well as they're just generally good for the environment um, so uh, once we uh, so not only will the restaurants be uh, producing less waste but so will the farms since most farmers tend to throw out their excess corn stock when the season's over. So once we, uh, once we sell our uh, products to uh, the majority of restaurants near us and they're giving out our cutlery, um, the, uh, like our town in general will be producing a lot less waste since we're not going to be using the mass, uh, the mass produced plastic cutlery that's just generally bad for the environment. So with this, our town will be a lot more green as well as um, just like uh, it can make our town more pride worthy, sort of. So to demonstrate how our proposal works, we must first look at the name of our company, which is Cyclum. Cyclum is actually derived from the Latin word for life cycle, and we plan on living up to this name by transforming crops that have reached the end of their life cycle into usable products. So the first step in this process is the transportation of feedstock, which is collected from our shareholders who are located throughout Virginia, to the biorefinery. The biorefinery is where the extensive process of transforming feedstock into polylactic acid or PLA and then molding that PLA into usable utensils takes place. And then we have to transport them back to our warehouse, which again we would rely on the our transportation services for that. And then the final step is selling and distributing our products to businesses within Virginia. And when we receive our utensils from the biorefinery, we are assuming that they would come in bulk packages, which we would sort and label, which makes it easier for us as a company to resell them. And the businesses who purchase from us are actually able to repackage and resell our products once they're purchased and delivered. 
and this helps us reach a wider variety of consumers so that PLA can become more commonplace. The normalization of PLA is important because it means that we can continue to produce a form of plastic and profit off of it, but can do so more sustainably. Implementing our idea will be a challenge, but we have a plan. First, our resources will be acquired by local farmers who donate their corn waste. In return, they will get a small cut of the profits. Second, we will have a warehouse located in Culpeper where all the work will be done. We will have our own workers for labor. We plan to start this around the beginning of 2024, but we will check our progress yearly. To check our growth, we will first see how many products we have sold, and second, compare how many products we have sold with other basic plastic cutlery companies. As long as we sell our product and people continue to use our product, we will know that we are successful. So this is our budget. So to make the molds for the cutlery will be um, $12,000. And then to make the polylactic acid will be $8,000. So in the first year, we will spend $20,000 to make the cutlery. And then for our warehouse, will cost $42,000 a year. And then for our... Um, Worker positions, we have one management position with a salary of $100,000, um, four office workers with a salary of $50,000, one supervisor position with a salary of $75,000, and then four warehouse workers with a salary of $40,000. So in total, we're asking for $650,000. As stated before, Cyclum is a perfect example of corporation and consumer coming together in a perfect relationship. We are bringing bio-based products to you. So what do you say? Will you let us help you to become an educated, proactive member of the bio-based community in Virginia? And remember, you're not just investing in a company, you're investing in a movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like the local aspect of using corn products for that because it's certainly something we see in the central Virginia area a lot is corn farms. Now, biocompostable products. Um, are you familiar with the difference between biocompostable versus biodegradable? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we are. So actually, and I did notice that. I did more research on PLA and found that it does take very specific conditions for it to break down. So it it technically can be called biodegradable, but it's more of in like specific a setting. So it's not what you would typically think of when you think of biodegradable. Um, great. So then a common issue with these biocompostable products is exactly kind of you've alluded to. They require an industrial setting. Did you consider adding a, to the budget like a way to transport this product to a uh, industrial decomposition place? Because one of the issues with biocompostable plastics is since they don't just decompose on their own if you leave them outside in the rain, how then do you kind of make sure there's, there's a place for consumers to get it back to that decomposition facility? Just curious if you thought about that at all. Yeah. We did not really take that into consideration, but that would be a great idea for a better way to dispose of our products. I think our business model is more centered around we're taking disposed plastics from other places and using it to give it more of a second life rather than this is our single-use plastic that we're turning from a single-use plastic into renewable. It's not so much biodegradable and renewable as it is having already been renewed from another source. So that's more of what we're getting at, giving things second lives rather than taking a first life and making it renewable. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.
Jesus. Have at it. Hi, I'm Haley, and this is the Beekeeper Experience. These are my <laughs> mates, Caitlin, JC, Preston, Rowan, Noah, and Gabe. Our proposal is the Beekeeper Experience. We are centralized in Virginia, and we're supporting the conservation of bees. The conservation of bees is very important to the production of pollination, economic benefits, and every every use, everyday use of products that people use. So I will be talking about the um, current issues that affect pollinators every day. So I would assume that everyone in this room consumes vegetables and fruits on the daily, but who enables us to do so? Bees. So um, currently, the Virginia Department of Transportation is taking action to help the bees with the um, wildflower and pollinator habitat um, program that helps to conserve the habitats of bees. But will this be enough? Um, emissions and pesticides are constantly um, causing the decline of bee habitats in Virginia and our program will help to make this more known by the population and will help to even prevent this. Our group wanted to focus on an issue that isn't widely known when it comes to the economic benefits of conservation, which led us to beekeeping conservation. We believe this is an important topic because bees are such important pollinators in our life despite their declining population. Almost 4 billion food products are harvested from ecosystems where bee pollination occurs, which results in around $3 billion back into the U.S. economy. We believe that by promoting beekeeping and promoting the safe habitats of bees, we can help protect them. So our main objective for this project is to create a local business that will help maintain a small bee colony uh, in order to help slow down uh, the declining population in the world around us. So by doing this, we're going to buy a couple acres of land and scatter a uh, colonies of bees all over it with flowers for them to pollinate and while that's going on we're going to have an interactive tour that people can go on and they can experience how it is to be a beekeeper by doing things such as harvesting honey or making sure the bees are healthy um, and hopefully by doing this we encourage all the customers uh, the um, of the protection of bees and they go out to do some stuff themselves.
Our group does not actually have a physical demonstration due to our topic mainly being a business idea rather than a physical like object we could bring in or a model we could design. Our, our beekeeper farm could be used to generate revenue for nonprofit organizations and to spread awareness to tourists at our bee farm about well, concerns related to pollinators. Our bee farm would also be self-sufficient after it opens up from the FOF donation due to it being able to generate revenue from entry ticket fees and a gift shop at the end of the tours we would offer. Our farm would also be able to be self-sufficient in paying for the wages of workers after, after the first annual year of going through the FOF donation, which would cover them. Our farm would also cover our farm would also cover the essentially the our farm would be completely self-sufficient after opening due to it being able to cover the fees after the FOF donation because of the revenue it would generate from the entry ticket and gift shop. So for the logistics of our project, we plan to open a bee farm covering about 20-ish acres uh, and then once we have started constructing that, we'll expect the farm to open around 2024 to 2025, just to allow time for flowers to grow and for the bees to be delivered and get accustomed to the new environment. Uh, we would have trained uh, professionals dealing with bees on site, of course, to guide people through the interactive tour. And then we would know our project is successful after we see the revenue generated from it and the effect it has on raising awareness for bee pollination specifically. For the costs of all of this, um, we will need to buy two acres worth of flowers, which will cost $15,714. And to water those flowers every year, we will need 50,000 gallons of water, which will cost us $79. And in order to have a tour guide to um, like conduct all of the beekeeping work that the participants will do, um, we will need an annual salary of $60,000. In order to start up the gift shop, we will need $100,000 in order to um, get the beehives for our bees to live in, you will need $1,000. And in order to purchase the bees to fill those beehives and of course make the honey, you will need $568. And um, to buy all the land that we need, which is 20 acres, we will need $94,000 based off the price of land in Central Virginia. And then to ensure that the participants in the beekeepers experience don't get hurt, we will need 25 beekeeping suits, which will cost $2,500. All of that leading to a total cost of $273,861, as well as $60,079 per year, meaning that we will be able to sustain the beekeepers experience for over 10 years after the initial $1 million donation. After considering many different topics related to the economic benefits of conservation, our group believes that the beekeeper's experience is the one that deserves your funding. Not only does it promote conservation in a fun and interactive way unlike any other experience seen before, but we will also donate all extra money from ticket revenue and gift shop expenses to local nonprofit bee conservation organizations in Central Virginia. By sponsoring the beekeeper's experience, you are sponsoring a brighter future in Central Virginia. Thank you so much for that. Now, one thing we're kind of curious about, so interactive ecotourism and agritourism ventures often pose some serious injury potential for people that participate. One obvious issue I see here for you guys is how to handle someone that has allergies to bee stings, especially if they're unaware of them. Because while beekeeping suits are great, they are not 100% effective. Have you considered how you might handle that as a part of your business model? So obviously, um, having the beekeeping suits does help, like you said, yes. But there is potential for 
injury to still happen. Uh, I think getting waivers and permission slips involved beforehand would definitely help with uh, raising awareness for some of those dangers. And then additionally, I think having, like obviously having a requirement for anyone under a certain age to have a guardian with them to ensure their safety. And then because we have so much money left over from our budgeting, that would also very much help to cover any additional uh, unexpected uh, money that's required. It's true, you would have money for the insurance you would need. Uh, any other questions? Thank you so much. Take it away. Hello, I'm Lillian Holly. This is Lily, Sophie, John, Liam, Gage, and Mal. And today we'll be talking to you guys about outdoor vertical farms. So our proposal is that we implement a singular outdoor vertical farm in Virginia and see how it will impact farmers and the environment. Also, we'll be seeing if it would be a plausible idea to implement other ver outdoor vertical farms in Virginia. The first idea of outdoor vertical farms was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. According to myth, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were the first historically, first historical precursor to vertical farms. During 1991, a concept of vertical farms was acquired from a thought experiment from Professor Dixon Despommier, who he put his classes through it on how to decrease the carbon footprint. They came up with the idea of doing an indoor vertical farm that is 30 um, stories high, and it will from what they found out, it would lead to feeding 50,000 people. The first modern vertical farm is an indoor vertical farm. It was finished in 2011. It's called Aero Farms. Aero Farms is, uses aquaponics, and it is completely computer controlled. Outdoor vertical farms is an important thing to have implement because it will use less resources, increase yield, and use less space. For an example of using less resources is when um, farmers and people implement less, more modern technology then there would be about 70% less water usage in the vertical farms. While we are trying to get outdoor vertical farms, it is more commonly known for the indoor vertical farms. 
There is one currently being built in um, Chesterfield, Virginia, that is going to be 30 feet high, and they say it takes seven to six or six to seven years to build. And how they are doing it is very costly and contains a lot of energy. They are trying to make it so that it is like a spring day every day in that farm. There is another one that is also being built that should be done from the Bowser Farms. Um, and should be done around this winter. Um, there are some concerns with indoor vertical farming, things such as the high prices and the technology usage and the energy being used to maintain these vertical farms. If we're doing it outside, the energy usage will go down given that the sun is what we are using instead of the lights that they have to keep up. And we are attempting to make vertical farming more sustainable than it already is. So the specific issue that we would like to address is the lack of outdoor vertical farms in Virginia. So as previously mentioned, there are no major outdoor vertical farms in Virginia, while there is an indoor one in Chesterville County. So the reason why this needs to be addressed is because of the benefits that outdoor vertical farming can bring. So vertical farming, when compared to traditional farming, uses a lot less space. So one acre of um, vertical farming can produce, depending on the crop, the same as 10 or even 20 acres of a traditional farm. Now when compared with indoor vertical farming, it's a lot less costly in that it does not require the use of LED lights. So in indoor vertical farming, each shelf needs its own LED light, which leads to LED lighting being quite costly counting for 50 to 65 percent of the electricity bill. So our proposal is to create a 372 square meter outdoor vertical farm here in Virginia. The reason our group chose to do outdoor vertical farming is pretty simple. It's because vertical farming provides a better use of space for farming than normal farm, uh, meaning that a uh, vertical farm can produce the same amount or possibly even more depending on the size as a normal farm. Outdoor vertical farming cuts down on pollution, waste of water, and occupational hazards that a typically a normal farm would have. Outdoor vertical farms are better than indoor vertical farms because indoor vertical farms have solely rely on technology and are very high maintenance. With all that technology needed to run those comes a high power consumption rate, which leads to a high electric bill. But with outdoor vertical farming, uh, all the things that the uh, plants need are normally naturally provided. And whatever the plant does not get, we can provide for the plant so that it can live on. So our, our demonstration is a vertical farm. It would be implemented outdoors. The cup on top would be our would be our water collection system for it could be more self-sufficient and without having to go out and water it, you'd have collection system to collect the water. I'm excited to share with y'all today <clears throat> how green technology is a major role in helping in the production of our outdoor vertical farms. In early May, Shepherds and Sons will be letting us use one of their farms to convert into a vertical farm. One of our main goals is to maximize food production and lessen land usage. 
Green Technologies. We will be partnering with them and they will bring their expertise in sustainable farming and we will use their knowledge in water recyclability and one of the ways we'll be testing these farms in their time at Shepherds and Sons will be we will test the energy and resource efficiency and the water usage of these farms. All right, so with the budget, it costs $2,200 to $2,600 for the farm bed that we would grow the crops on. Per, that's per square meter. It costs $44 per square meter of soil, and it costs $15,000 for the rain collection tank. So we can make a total of 350 square meters of this vertical farm. In total, it costs $983,568. So the rain collection system will help us to water our plants and it will help us to grow the plants. The crop beds will be, the, be where the plants are grown and the soil will help to grow the plants. In conclusion, traditional agriculture has caused uh, millions of acres of land usage to be gone and um, in order to fix this problem we need vertical farming in order and because vertical farming um, it provides the most sustainable way to give us food for our population for our world and it allows our wildlife and plants to flourish. So in order to achieve this, we need our, the funds for our proposal in order to make vertical farming better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Vertical farms certainly represent a interesting way forward in dealing with our land use issue. One question I have is that historically outdoor vertical farms have struggled to produce enough light in a terrace structure because of course when you build something tall one part of your structure is going to be blocked out and this is what's necessitated the use of indoor vertical farms. Um, what have you considered as part of your solution for this so far? Well, our part of our solution, we've considered having the lower, the lower tiers of the vertical farm being tilted more and tilted in opposite directions. That way, the sunlight can hit those plants more. Or they could then get more sunlight to grow. And we'd put the plants that need less sunlight near the bottom because they'd be less likely to get a, a whole bunch of sunlight of everywhere else. The top ones would be your full day sunlight. The bottom ones would be your partial day. It just depends on what day, what time of day it is. So can you help us understand? So we've got our slant here, kind of our cottage roof. Is the slant intended to face the sun from this way, or is it going to go this way? Well, we tried to build the structure where it's straight up and down. But the slant of the um, different ones is for the different types of day. It just depends on the sunlight. It depends on where the sunlight is. Because if it's, depending on what side it is on, depends on what part of the plants get more sunlight. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are not quite done, so please listen. As I said at the beginning, you guys would be grading each other's presentations to decide who, was, who you think should get the million dollars. So at this moment, I need one member of your group to walk across the hall to our office and get a Chromebook and come back. You're going to submit your dollar amount. One person from each group, please stand up now and 